Hi, I'm Sarah Whiting. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at Rice. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for the inaugural Rice School of Architecture Llewellyn Davis Sani Innovative Practice Lecture. Before I start my introduction, however, I'd like to thank the MFA Houston for permitting us to use the um, auditorium here, and also the staff of the Rice Design Alliance, especially Catherine Fosdick and Mary Swift, who helped us in organizing that great reception and lecture here at the museum. But my biggest thanks goes to Randir Sani, president of Llewellyn Davies Sani, who's sitting right in the second row, who's sponsoring this lecture, the first in a five-year series devoted to showcasing innovation in architectural practice. This year marks Llewellyn Davies Sani's 30th anniversary, and Randy came to my office last summer to talk to his me about how he might mark that milestone while also marking the 40th anniversary of his obtaining his Master of Architecture and Urban Design degree from Rice's School of Architecture. He attended Rice on a fellowship, and <coughs> alumni and students, please take note, he felt compelled to give back to the school. <laughs> I'll stop there. Um, in an age of global warning, warming, subprime mortgage crises, 9.4% unemployment, and reduced support for the arts, it's hard to be optimistic about practice in the United States. Randy, however, maintains an almost evangelical enthusiasm. I use that term with some hesitation given our proximity to Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church. But truly, Randy's passion is infectious. He runs LDS as a small and agile practice that covers everything from architecture and urban design to investment advising, and there's a lot in between. It was his desire that this annual lecture offer a model of such innovative approaches to practice for our students, underscoring that they need to understand that such agility is not just an ingredient for survival in architecture, but will permit students to transform the world. This message, with its optimistic, projective undertone, perfectly captures what we're trying to do at the School of Architecture. Over the past quarter century, architecture has seemingly split into a paralyzing Jekyll and Hyde divide, with pragmatic, pro pro pragmatic problem solving, it's a problem with alliteration when you actually try and say it out loud, <laughs> pragmatic problem solving marking the one extreme, and pure theory on the other. If we expect architects to have any role in the future, writ large, we can't afford to be passive. We have to address this problem head on, quickly, and on two fronts, with our students and with the public. Rather than seeing practice and theory as combatants, we need to forge a model that fuses them together in a productive, projective approach to the world. Rice's size permits us to be a think tank filled with hypotheses about life. We teach speculative practice, an architecture that exceeds mere analysis. Our students speculate on real issues, ranging from the suburban house to work-life conditions in China, ranging from issues of legibility to ones of politics and subjectivity, with innovative designs that offer innovative possibilities for really changing the world. It's an architecture that wants to have an impact in the world, not merely by solving problems, but by identifying possibilities. And one of the best ways to do this is to establish a voice among our students by putting voices as models in front of them. Choosing Liz Diller to inaugurate this innovative practice series was a no-brainer. Diller, a partner in the firm, New York firm Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, is one of the most innovative voices practicing today in the field of architecture. The only architects to have received a MacArthur Genius Grant, the firm has designed a cloud in Switzerland, the Blur Building, which was a pavilion for the 2002 Swiss Expo, a bubble in Washington, an inflatable event space planned for the cylindrical courtyard of the Hirshhorn Museum, and a culture shed in New York for the Hudson Yards. They're perhaps best known for their elevated park in New York along the High Line and their extraordinary renovation of Lincoln Center, which represents the center's history, or respects the center's history, while transforming it into an entirely contemporary complex. They've been in the news recently because of their recent selection for such prestigious projects as the Broad Museum in LA and the Museum of Image and Sound in Rio de Janeiro both warmer places in Houston right now. <laughs> I've known Liz for a long while and have enormous respect for her incessant, tireless, and very precise drive that consistently exceeds the limits of architecture. Its materiality, its programming, its form, and its practice, I would say its very definition. I'm so glad that she's here tonight to inaugurate the series and to immerse us in innovation. Welcome to Houston. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I, um, 
at the risk of, uh, of, of meandering through the, through the evening, um, I've decided to put together just a, kind of a sampling or a range of, of things that we're uh, currently working with, uh, current projects and recent projects. Um, there, there is a little bit of method to my madness, and maybe you'll detect it, but um, I wanted to actually um, start with, a, you know, with, that, with that typical divide that people assume that um, uh, the moment one builds somehow separation from one's theoretical work. And um, our studio started about 30 years ago um, with um, uh, our independent agendas really away from uh, the profession, uh, following the discipline in a certain way. We're very interested in uh, space and the culture of space. Um, but we wanted to do our work um, um, in the public realm, but without the constraints of clients and budgets. Um, so we invented um, uh, our own projects, and we found the money somehow, and we borrowed the sites. Um, and we uh, just kind of went ahead in some trajectory. I have no idea. It, there, there was no goal in mind. It was simply project after project. And one develops certain um, trajectories in the work, uh, certain themes. Um, when I look back and, and the opportunity to, to put together some things for this talk uh, made me really think about what are the what are the, some of the ongoing themes um, and and one of them um, has to do with uh, a kind of healthy um, uh, respect for uh, kind of pushing architecture away or the conventions of, of um, uh, hard and permanent things um, and that's something that keeps kind of uh, uh, weaving through the through the work and we're always doing multiple projects. Um, but before I go into some of those projects, I really did want to show a couple of bricks and mortar things because they're also part of the practice. And um, we don't really discern between our um, uh, th these projects, the projects for clients and the, and the projects that are um, absolutely independent uh, or have some kind of other structure. Um, we just kind of keep doing them. And we have a certain um, a part of the studio which is devoted to money losing with a head of the, you know, like a, uh, someone in charge of that. And, um, but <laughs> um, the, way, the way it works is that we just kind of, we, we just kind of move forward and we get bigger and bigger somehow. We're about 70 strong right now. Uh, that's about the limit. Um, and, but it allows us to make experiments at all different scales and allows us to um, in practice, you don't often uh, pick your sites uh, or your clients or your budgets or anything like that, but you're able to kind of weave the, uh, somehow the trajectories seem to come through. Um, anyway, I wanted to, to just mention very quickly the Broad Project because there's one image that's circulating on, on, uh, um, on the web and it's like the same image and no one knows anything about this project so people keep asking. Um, so <clears throat> it's, a, it's a private collection uh, the site is on Grand Avenue, just opposite uh, Disney Hall. And as you can see, the, the site, the limits of the site are uh, much smaller than, than the uh, Disney Hall, much shorter. Um, and uh, it's, it's a private collection for Eli Broad, who's a um, fairly eccentric person um, in, uh, in L.A. and a really great philanthropist, but also someone that's um, kind of very tough character, um, and um, but has been a terrific um, with this project, and we won this on the basis of a competition. Um, the idea here is that on this urban street, very uh, important urban thoroughfare, uh, the program was to um, to have a uh, uh, a storage facility for his collection, and as well as a, a space for display. Um, the concept. Um, that we won the competition on is based on um, uh, the, what we call the vault and the veil. And the vault is um, what holds the collection. It's a, it's a, it's a mass, it's, a, um, it's opaque, and it floats. Um, and, um, and the public is, um, has a couple of opportunities to interact with it, um, see it from below, see it from the outside, kind of move through it, stand on top of it. Um, and, uh, and then circulate through it um, and have some privileged views. Um, the veil is the structure that goes on top of the vault and actually produces the space of the building. Um, the veil is a, um, a, a, a prefabricated concrete uh, structure um, and it's, um, 
uh, it brings in light, um, uh, diffuse light from the sky and, and also from the sides. And so here is uh, the two parts that just come together. It's a super, super simple idea. Um, and so this is it without its side walls. Um, the vault itself is, is, um, is a very plastic uh, piece. It's carved and um, it's, it has spaces that are just kind of um, uh, found inside of it. Oops, sorry. Um, and, and the veil is, is porous. This is one of the uh, notions that, that to build next to Gary, um, the project has to be entirely different. So if um, Gary is shiny and reflective, this is porous and, uh, and matte. Um, and it, uh, it, Disney Hall is not really about bringing light in, it's really about making a, a space that's inwardly focused. This is somehow trying to seep in some of the energy um, or producing some of the energy and, and pushing it out to Grand Avenue. Um, so this two-way system is, is very important. Um, I want to just point out that the, so this is the way from the lobby up uh, to the top of the vault um, and their, um, uh, the skylight system, which is part of the whole veil structure, kind of wraps down. Um, so in this um, concrete structure, um, I'll get to that in a second, but the circulation system is straight up um, to the top, um, and uh, you have the experience with the art, and then you meander down in the circuitous uh, staircase that has uh, views of, the, of the, uh, uh, the holdings of the institution. And um, so you come in, and then you, you come up uh, to this gallery that's one, basically one acre, uh, which is entirely column-free. So the veil is able to span 200 feet in both directions and is able to bring its load down on the sides. And as you can see here, the, the, the light is um, it's not direct, it's indirect, it's very ethereal. And um, the feel, um, I think, is, is one that, um, that you, you, it's a little magical. You don't quite know how, how that's done. So this is coming back down and on the outside. And um, the, the way the structure works is, is the, um, the skylights and the direction uh, of the skylights basically is brought down like a honeycomb right through and it has its residue on the side walls. And so it looks very, very different uh, to, the, to the north and to the south and to the, and to the east and to the west. Um, so um, the other project that, uh, another um, hard bones project, is one that is just about to open. In a couple of days, we're going to uh, have a, uh, an opening celebration at Brown University. And um, I just, I'm really proud of it, and I, I wanted to show it. Um, it's, Brown has uh, undertaken this initiative of, um, uh, of having a, uh, making a building that's not um, possessed by any faculty, by any uh, school or discipline um, at, at Brown. It's, it's basically a, um, uh, it's a kind of merit-based uh, series of spaces that, are, that can be um, booked. Uh, like production studios for the semester or for short, shorter terms based on projects and it could be any uh, collection of students or students and faculty or faculty. Um, and the, um, uh, the innovation uh, of this is really terrific. I mean, I don't know uh, very many um, uh, university buildings that are made with the, um, with the intention of, uh, of, of pedagogy, right? To, to really kind of produce a new pedagogy with a new type of building. Anyway, the type of building that we came back to inevitably is the loft building um, is the most uh, uh, able to sustain anything, you know, given the multidisciplinary nature of, the, of, the, um, of, of, of what was going to happen inside. But w this is a loft with a twist, and the twist is that it's sheared down the middle and just uh, uh, displaced so that um, all the floors are misaligned. And in that misalignment, uh, there are um, now eight levels, or eight half levels. Um, and each one has the ability of communicating with um, two uh, next to it. And the intention is to actually to, to produce some more discourse um, and to, on this very small footprint of a building, to kind of have to make something happen. Um, so here it is. It's, it's um, 
um, kind of trying to get close to getting open, and you could see that um, effect uh, from the outside. It's it's clad in zinc, and the zinc is pleated um, to allow light to come into um, to certain office space where where light is wanted and needed, um, and. Uh, so it, it actually was pretty interesting develop, developing this, uh, the geometry for these panels. Um, the, um, there's a lot of uh, material use that's a, a little bit odd. I mean, here, this entire um, uh, recital hall is, is made out of two by fours, just stacked and laminated two by fours, slightly twisted to make uh, them into um, uh, the panels into, um, into great acoustic shapes. Um, but you can start to see here this um, uh, bits of the displacement. It happens um, on the ground floor as well, and I don't have photos yet of this. This is just brand new. But this auditorium goes right up, and um, uh, there's a kind of raked landscape uh, that, that it extends into where films will be shown um, out of doors in, uh, in the summer and so forth. So there's a, there's a kind of connection to the outdoors. Um, and here we are at grade, uh, looking down and up, and so forth. And, and this really characterizes pretty well. Not quite, uh, you know, things are just starting in here, but you can start to see um, these these half levels. And then um, everything, uh, because there's no social space in this building, there's absolutely no uh, footprint for people, uh, for a place for people to gather we um, use the communicating stair between these half levels and extended um, the, the landing. So this is the landing of the stair, and we just extended it into a little living room. So there are these stacked, actually, they go all the way up. There are like six of them. Um, and that's really the place where um, uh, students can find each other and, and hang out and exchange ideas. Um, so th those are just a couple of the, the projects that are um, Underway, there are many more. Um, but I, I decided, to, I was thinking about the, uh, just more about the ephemera uh, today, about how we're uh, often resisting um, building, where it's, it's, every project is, is unique, um, but, but not every project is really about uh, bricks and mortar. Um, and this was one of the really important ones that we did. Um, this was just after 9-11. Um, and uh, it was a moment where everyone was caught off guard in New York. Um, uh, no one really knew what to do. Um, and uh, uh, there was a, a huge amount of, uh, uh, like a compulsion almost, to go to the site and bear witness. Um, while there was a rescue effort going on and then, um, and then a cleanup effort. And um, all of that was happening. Um, as crowds were um, just milling around and wanting to see um, that kind of emptiness. Um, and it's really, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about visuality, the culture of vision, um, and a lot of work on tourism and, and stuff. And this was a particular um, thing that, that was, it wasn't sick, it was really interesting in a kind of perverse and poetic way. Um, and we felt like we really needed to do something, just like doctors came to action. Um, there was a kind of civic uh, need um, and a desire that we had to just do something. To, and, and it was a moment where the city wasn't paying attention. And so we said, well, let's just um, find a way of building the structure that kind of got in the way of other, uh, uh, got the, the public out of the way of, of the, uh, the cleanup effort. And so we built this, this big ramp, basically, that just went, um, this was a, just being constructed, and um, it just went up to, uh, to be slightly elevated um, so that the public can just, um, to just bear witness. And um, it was just a moment in time, and we, we made an instant foundation, and we got money, and we just um, got a contractor and just did it in a couple of weeks. Um, but this is um, often, um, you know, we, we're dealing with um, certain uh, kind of uh, uh, things that are really not quite um, about uh, uh, material sustenance and, uh, and permanence. Um, this project, um, Sarah mentioned this, which was a big turning point uh, for us. Um, we had a kind of cult following, uh, but we had never done anything like a mass project or mass spectacle. Um, uh, we won a competition uh, for Expo 2002 um, in Switzerland to um, to do this this thing, we we just thought it wouldn't be nice to make the weather somehow, and to uh, 
and, and to uh, really contemplate um, this uh, another kind of uh, uh, cultural uh, compulsion, which is um, uh, for a higher definition everything. Um, we're also interested in media and simulation um, and uh, technologies. Um, uh, that the Hanover Fair just before this um, had all this, you know, incredible equipment and, and uh, um, uh, visualization techniques and surround sound and surround uh, vision and everything. And we were interested in making something that was um, low def, but used technologies. So, um, so this project, this was all about being on the water, and we we basically took the water out of the lake, we filtered it. Um, so here's the diagram. We, we filtered this water through a succession of, of filters. Um, at the same time, there was a, a, water, a, a, a weather station on the building that read the air temperature, the wind, the uh, humidity, the dew point, and so forth, and, um, and was able to kind of um, uh, give direction to 35,000 water nozzles um, that were uh, all over this, this structure that we made. Um, so, uh, the, so, so when the wind came, um, it, from one side it would fill in that side. If, uh, if it was too humid, it would slow down. So basically this, this uh, project was, uh, it was super simple. It was a tensile structure, um, post-tension four touchdown points in the lake, the lake bed, um, went deep into the lake. And the structure was, um, was, uh, was all very kind of thin and ephemeral, but well detailed. Um, basically, it was just like the structure and plumbing, a whole project, um, and there was no space, actually. Um, so it was kind of um, featureless and spaceless and depthless. Um, so here are the, some, of the, um, uh, some of the elements that are um, being read, and this system um, was an intelligent system, and it learned over time what to do, depending on the weather, so you have to train it. Um, only problem was it took six months to train. It was only a six-month project, uh, but uh, anyway. Um, but it was getting smarter and smarter as uh, it was getting along. Sometimes this uh, this this fog thing just kept growing and growing, and um, and sometimes it became a little dangerous. Um, it started to wipe out highways. And, uh, anyway, so the, on the right side is the feel of how it was inside, and on the left. Um, uh, in, in, uh, just, I don't know how many times faster, it, 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 but it was very alive and very, very dynamic and was changing every moment of time. And sometimes revealing its bones and then just filling out instantly. Anyway, we started screwing around with nature. We started to get really, really interested in um, uh, effects how architecture can, um, can make effects without, without walls, just with, in this case, just atomized droplets. Um, and it's not to say that it was so easy to do, it was, very, it was technically very challenging to, uh, to make a cloud. Um, but you know, you, we're used to kind of jumping out of an airplane uh, without a parachute and then figure, oh, okay, hope there's a trampoline down there. Uh, so there was nothing, there was such thing as a, um, cloud engineer, you know, that we can consult about this. But um, there were enough people out there that knew a little bit of something. But everyone said it wouldn't work, and it actually did. It did work, and it was a very, very important project for us. You came up onto the angel deck, <clears throat> and just underneath there, there were waters of the world that were served. Um, so not only did you uh, was the water the context; it was the major building material. It was. Um, it was also um, what you what you breathed, and um, and and what you uh, what you consumed, um, and there were so many interesting stories about this. Like for example, uh, the, the Swiss government um, uh, wanted us to put in a sprinkler system um, in, order, in, in order for us to get a building permit. I, but it was every pro you know there was nothing about this project we could. We couldn't really convince them that um, there was nothing flammable, nothing combustible. This was the world's largest sprinkler system. Um, but, but we often find that we, you know, we're someplace in between them. We don't, can't quite, um, but, but, but we just slipped through the cracks because they didn't really quite know how to gauge this as a building. Um, what lake and, was it? Huh? What lake was it? Uh, it was Lake Neuchâtel. Uh, it was about an hour from Geneva. 
Um, and, and this was, uh, 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 Jean Nouvel also had a structure, the cube, that was in another lake, a nearby lake, but it was all part of this expo thing. Uh, I should mention that Piccolo de Rist was the artistic director, so there was an opportunity actually to do something in Switzerland. And, um, and, uh, but what was really kind of fascinating was initially, the Swiss thought that this was a waste of money uh, because fog was in, in uh, rampant supply in Switzerland. Why would anybody want to make uh, more fog? And, um, and so we, well, you know, anyway, it went ahead. Um, and then they just, they, they started to love it. And then we just found it on, on, on postage stamps and on lotto cards and on bottles of Kirschwasser and on everything. It just was proliferated everywhere. Um, and it, t it turned out that the Swiss adapted it to stand for the Swiss doubt. Um, that is, you know, EU, not EU. Um, it, it's this kind of in-betweenness that, um, that, that somehow this thing became a symbol of, and then they fully embraced. Anyway, um, the weather, some, sometimes you couldn't tell uh, whether it was man-made or not. Um, and it was just kind of... Uh, very important project for us. This was, you know, made up. Finally, we got rid of it. Thank God, uh, became a black cloud. They wanted to, um, they wanted to keep it forever um, as a monument, and uh, and we just we talked them out of it. Um, uh, there's nothing that that ages faster than uh, Expo pavilions, <laughs> and the idea of this ephemeral thing of being there forever as a monument to itself was just crazy. Anyway, so we blew it up, and then the steel was then salvaged and, um, and, and it was sent to China. Uh, and, and, and this, and we got immortalized here. This is like the most incredible honor for an architect building in Switzerland is to have chocolate um, after their building. Anyway, but, but, but then, you know, I started to look through our projects and realize that we have this, there's something about water and smoke and air and that it just seems to uh, keep coming in and out of our work. This is a project that I, we never published, really. It's in Kemi. Um, and we, um, in the harbor there, uh, there was kind of a frozen harbor in the winter, very, very cold, um, and, uh, and it was for the snow show. And we decided to just uh, do a project in the lake Actually, we, t we, we went into the lake and we cored out. We actually, um, um, uh, you know, with equipment, we made these uh, kind of like the inversion of a waffle slab, but downwards um, into the lake. So this was all frozen very, very thick. And we filled each one of these um, vessels, essentially, with um, different bottled waters, you know. And this is on that water theme. So we, we got waters from all over the world. I mean, unbelievable um, amount of waters, and um, and they're they're really um, um, you know kind of and, and and we etched the the actual logo in the ice. And there's an LED um, that was just inserted there um, earlier before it uh, it kind of refroze. And um, the idea was that um, uh, it would just stay there until the spring, and it would just melt, and everything would go away. Um, <coughs> this was, uh, uh, you know, an an another another project involving water was for the Venice Biennale. It was several years ago, we decided that we would take canal water and um, make from it the best um, espresso in Venice, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we got water engineers um, and uh, we brought this, we took this to a really, really high technical level. Um, and this was a kind of early design, but we had totally engineered this thing um, and got permissions from the government to, to do this. We're, you can see the pipe that's coming down on the right, it's going straight down into the canal. And just you could see the, the, in the various tanks, the water is getting more and more transparent. Um, anyway, we got, um, it was, uh, uh, because it had um, filtered water had been used to clean fish in Venice, there was a precedent, and we were able to actually uh, move it up the ladder um, in, the, um, uh, in the, uh, the, the local government, and got total permissions at the highest level. But when it started coming back down through the, um, 
uh, the bureaucracy, um, it, it started to get uh, held up. And the reason why we, we ended up not being able to do it uh, because there were multiple contracts for, uh, for cleaning, for sanitizing the water in Venice. And we would um, have preempted the bid, um, uh, you know, as if there wasn't enough corruption in Venice. Uh, but they, they stopped us. Um, and, and then uh, I found this project that also we didn't, uh, we never really published. There was a project for, um, uh, about smoke. Um, and and just, just to think about, you know, um, uh, kind of nasty um, things that we ingest. Um, so uh, this was a kind of, um, it was a tribute to smokers, um, you know, who are now required to stand outside of buildings and, and do their thing. Um, but, it, but for the rest of us, that smoke is going into the sidewalk. And, um, but this allows there to be a kind of chimney, <coughs> occupiable chimney outside of buildings where smokers just could come in and that smoke just uh, rises up. And um, it's kind of no, no smoking. That's the logo. And that's right at the base of the cone. Um, and so um, the, the kind of miraculous thing here is that we... Um, <laughs> We were able to um, invent a um, an interface that uh, that is based on smoke. You sort of you, it hits the screen, the, you, the puff of smoke hits the screen, and then activates um, the um, a website where all the smokers in the city are reconnected. Um, <laughs> anyway, that didn't go very far, and for some reason it wasn't. We couldn't raise any money for it. Here, no one won't believe that. Um, but then, then moving along the air theme, um, uh, we, oh, this is a project that's real. Um, and um, it's amazing sometimes the things that get built. Uh, um, so this building, the Hirsch Farm, is on the, it's on the Washington Mall. And um, uh, the, the new director there um, asked us to expand that building uh, by something like 18,000 square feet. And, um, and it was his idea to just make a kind of a, an extension of the Hirschhorn into the mall. And we learned very, very quickly that uh, the Smithsonian and the, basically the federal government didn't like the idea of, of building out um, uh, into the mall. I mean, that was like a forbidden space. Um, but where could we get that 18,000 square feet? Ha! Ah, um, this building, by the way, is Gordon Bunshaft, 1974. Um, the, and and it, it has this very curious kind of uh, quality. It's concrete and it hovers um, and it just, um, it's not connected really to the ground except at the lobby, but it just hovers. Um, it's kind of, kind of cool. So you could see, um, you could see right, right through there. Um, um, and then it is just uh, windows and, and you go in there and you circulate around the galleries and you could look into the courtyard. Um, well, we figured, well, this is Perhaps um, that courtyard is a possible space. Um, so, but thinking um, on bigger terms, the Washington Mall is um, the one kind of great uh, place in the country that is about um, kind of civic civic mindedness, civic consciousness. It's a place where um, where protest is 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 invited, uh, and uh, at least uh, certain kinds of protest. Um, but but it's filled with um, with you know with with, with incredible um, uh, historic moments, and um, that kind of symbol of democracy was something that we wanted to grab. We actually literally wanted to grab the air of the mall and bring it into the building, and so that was the idea that this this expansion of the museum was to be a bubble, was to be a pneumatic structure um, that inhaled the mall. And um, that just kind of filled um, the available space. It leaked out the edges. It leaked out the top, um, and um, like that, with one continuous volume of air. Um, it was kind of, and this is this is the the uh, lounge that's just squeezed out the edge. Um, I think that if this had uh, gone any conventional way, the government would have said no way would this be uh, acceptable on the mall. But somehow it appeared um, in the New York Times on the front page one day. Um, and there was so much buzz around it. And the Smithsonian was asking, where did this come from? They didn't go through the bureaucracy of building something on the mall or building something at, at a Smithsonian institution. Um, it just kind of, it was a leak 
um, to the Times, and uh, and then there was an incredible um, uh, interest in this thing. Um, I think because it's so it's so um, uh, antithetical to those massive inert uh, authoritarian buildings on the mall, and it has a kind of exuberance that is much needed. And this is with the Obama early Obama administration. There was a it's kind of you know just everyone just loved it. Um, anyway, so the, uh, uh, there are multiple plans, you know, <laughs> ways that this um, will be used, and. Um, um, but we were very calm. We had to go through a lot of um, authorities and a lot of approvals um, with the with the government. One was, you know, what what actually do you see and from where do you see it? So from the mall uh, here, you see this. We convinced them it's like, it's a dome like the Capitol, and uh, <laughs> they somehow bought it. It was <laughs> um, anyway. It's this kind of <laughs> I sometimes I blush when I show this. Um, anyway, but the, 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 uh, we, were, we were really not um, allowed to make permanent, any kind of permanent anything to this, uh, um, to the Hirshhorn. We couldn't um, uh, uh, bolt to it or, or anything. So we were basically restraining it. It's like, um, it's like a helium balloon for Thanksgiving. We're just restraining it um, with these cables. So that's where you see those, those res um, the, the, the circular kind of constraints. Those are brought to the inside edge. And basically, the whole thing is sort of held at different points um, um, from the from the outside. And then from the inside of the galleries, you can see um, a little, slightly translucent. You can see a little bit, um, but this never really clings to the to the surface. Um, this is the way it's put up. It's basically unfurled twice a year, and each time for a month. Um, uh, there's a there are, there's a ring around the uh, circumference, um, and um, the, basically, the, uh, this, this um, uh, fiber, this very um, uh, high-strength fiber uh, fabric is, is, uh, is hoisted up, um, and then um, as it's hoisted up, um, a fan goes on, and it's very low pressure, and basically fills it up, and, um, and then uh, becomes, becomes this. And there's water ballast, that red. Is just around the circumference. It's just water, and it stabilizes in place. Um, I remember when um, when I made a presentation to one of the big uh, uh, government committees in Washington, and uh, they were just they didn't really understand uh, quite what they were seeing, or they they were they didn't react at all. Someone at one point asked, and these were a lot of gentlemen, like in their 70s, I think, or you know, suits, um, and uh, one of them asked. How long will it take to put up? We said the, the erection is going to take seven days. <laughs> the, fir the first erection will take seven days. And I didn't know what I was saying. And then that, um, I think, I don't know, that hit a chord. And, um, and, and then everybody was just like, just thought it was great after that. <laughs> I don't know. It was very, very strange. But anyway, um, I, I stopped saying that. I just did the um, the inflation or something. Um, but 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 after that that first time, then it becomes more habit, and then uh, it'll take three days. Um, but at each time, uh, we are we are uh, engineering this with a with a great uh, group of engineers in in Germany, Form TL, and and this is really complex. Just the patterning on this is very, very complex. So it actually is re, uh, reacting to certain uh, points of resistance in the building, but at the same time, it's keeping an asymmetrical form. So um, this has been uh, quite an adventure into the unknown. Um, I wanted to um, also show you this, this um, uh, project that we did. It was, uh, um, we had a retrospective at the Whitney, and um, it was a lot of our installations that we did in all different parts of the world brought into uh, the uh, museum in New York, and um, this is a little bit of also like uh, a kind of slightly nihilistic uh, project. So we accepted the retrospective, but at the same time we were very, very uncomfortable with making walls around these installations that were all meant to be uh, were designed for for other places at other times. Uh, well, we brought them back. Um, the, we, so we made an Uber installation. The red dotted line shows the path of this robot that we designed. Um, and the robot um, was a drill. Um, and the drill 
Uh, these are the brains. And we worked with Honeybee Robotics, these um, robotics engineers that made the Mars driller. Um, and basically the program um, uh, unwraps the wall. It maps the entire surface of the wall, all the ins and outs, hundreds and hundreds of feet. And, um, and, and uh, uh, imagines all the possible uh, places where this can drill. And it, it's sent always to a random spot that hasn't been drilled before. And so during uh, um, the show, you're in a gallery and you hear this. This is the sound it makes, just to prevent people from colliding with it. Um, and it's a real nuisance, acoustically. Uh, the kids drilling and makes dust and all of that. Um, and it and goes around the corners. This was really tricky to figure out how to do that. Um, but basically, it is on the autopilot, and for four months, it just does its thing. And eventually, um, it starts to um, it starts to take apart the the walls, um, and it makes um, it starts to undermine the curatorial text, and uh, and then uh, it 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 allows a kind of acoustic passage between one and the other gallery, and then all of a sudden pieces of walls start to come apart. Um, there's one thing that I wanted to identify, and this is just kind of uh, um, realization, like this next series of, of slides and images. Um, this patch of wall is, um, actually comes from another place. Um, it was um, uh, taken from the, the Museum of Modern Art, um, and it's a patch of wall that was under the standard stops, it's a Duchamp painting. Um, and that, was, that space was appropriated for the renovation uh, by the construction crew, and we managed to find that spot, um, and we wanted that piece of wall to be part of our uh, Amorma show. We were kind of interested in, um, in just, you know, I mean, this was a time of institutional critique still, and uh, we, were, we were just, um, we, we wanted to bring in, actually, um, a lot of, uh, different wall fragments from different museums all over the world. And uh, we managed to just identify this. And, uh, um, and then this was an a interesting process. We, we uh, um, identified, we surveyed the space, we, we um, identified the spot, and then we made a palette for exactly that size um, uh, piece. And then we, uh, uh, we cut it out of the wall. Um, and while we were cutting it out, and, and then we, we would then ship this to the Whitney. And it would have to come through, would it come through as a building material or as a piece of art? We couldn't, nobody, the registrar couldn't figure out how to bring this thing into the Whitney. Um, but anyway, while we were doing this, we had, the New York Times was, was observing, was really kind of crazy. Um, and they were writing a story on this. And um, um, so this was um, the, 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 the spot. The, so you could see the multiple layers of paint um, that that wall was painted um, at, at MoMA. It was like hundreds of layers of white paint. It added to the surface um, by, by about an eighth of an inch. Um, and we designed, in this one patch of the matte surface, we, um, um, there was a different behavior of the drug. Um, so where it was random, everywhere else, when it hit this patch, it started to drill um, in a regular grid. Um, and it's kind of a, a interesting, it's an interesting uh, kind of phenomenon. Um, so now, what happened after that uh, um, was um, that, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to see if I can uh, get this up. I wasn't able to, okay, so here, um, I'm going to just not reveal my desktop because it's super embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to um, show you this. So, so what happened? We, when when the show came down, we cut out this piece of wall, and then we cut it up into four pieces and just put it in storage. At which point, the MoMA called us and asked to acquire back that a piece of our wall um, for. Uh, or the permanent collection. It was just like the most bizarre Duchampian twist on um, twists. And so this is now uh, my partner Rick, one of my partners, um, at MoMA. 
um, installing one it was a quarter of this wall into uh, a show that pa Paolo Antonelli put on uh, called The Fragment. And uh, I'll just see if I could speed a little bit. Uh, whoops, there it is. Um, anyway, a peculiar um, kind of trajectory of this, uh, of this thing. Um, and then, um, just recently, not too long ago, when Maxi opened um, uh, Zaha's building, um, they asked us to make an installation there, and we thought, well, why not bring the drill in? You know, and <laughs> sitting around and had nothing to do. Um, and so we thought, well, okay, let's bring it in um, and, and make it do something different here. Maybe rather than take Zaha's building apart, maybe what it can do is it could become a, a drawing tool. And so we thought, well, why couldn't it drill holes um, in a kind of pattern to make an image, kind of like a, a bat screen? And so we started experimenting with different perforations, different size drill bits, different depths of penetration. Here you could see the depths of penetration. You could imagine that an image could, um, uh, could be produced. Um, and the image we wanted to make on this very, very long mural wall was um, an image uh, of the, uh, the oil spill, uh, the BP oil spill. And we just thought that this was just an, uh, abstract enough. And over the six months that this was up, um, we could there was something like, I don't know, several hundred thousand, maybe, maybe even a million holes uh, that this would uh, take to, to make this image. Um, this piece was called Drill Baby Drill. <laughs> and, um, and here is the, the dot screen, so it had to be kind of um, configured and, and remapped. And here we are testing um, the, dr the drilling capabilities and the depths and image making capabilities. And um, here it is at Maxi, um, uh, starting to make this image. Now, I should add that um, there, this kind of got screwed up. Um, it didn't quite finish performing its task before the show um, closed, and I think it's closing right now. So it's, it's more advanced than this, but it's not complete. But this is, uh, you know, like one of those trajectories. It's not, it's, it's going to continue to uh, go through its evolution. So there you can see a little bit of it. Okay, and then moving on to um, uh, stuff, nature, um, and rethinking um, the natural, just uh, there was a path there that was taking me to this, which is an installation that we did in Liverpool. And um, just based on, uh, we planted a, a grove of trees uh, in a brownfield site. And, and some of them behaved in a very curious way. And, um, you know, in, in, in England, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's perfect for um, English humor. Um, so these trees move extremely slowly. They're, um, they're, they're all planted, or, or several of them are planted on a, on a bias and off-center. So when they get, you know, sometimes they move past each other and they, they almost clip each other. And there are some, some interesting things that happen. Um, but this kind of fascination with the natural and rethinking um, its, its limits brought us to another uh, project that's more permanent um, in, its, in its ephemeral way, the High Line. Um, the High Line is, uh, is uh, and some of you may have already visited, it's, it's in three sections. Uh, section one is finished, section two is in construction, section three is trying to find its funding. Um, but this, it starts um, at Gansboard Street down in the Meatpacking District and winds its way up to the Hudson Yards. This is uh, the, the rail yards at uh, Penn Station. Um, and um, this is basically what you see from the street. Um, uh, the, this elevated uh, rail uh, line was used for um, industry um, and uh, basically to supply the warehouses and uh, and, and, and light industry in this part of, uh, of Chelsea. Um, this is, um, it, it became defunct in the 80s, early 80s, and just went to ruin. And uh, this is uh, a video um, up there. It's really, in certain areas, it's really quite, quite devastating and a, a real mess. Uh, but it winds its way through buildings and, um, and you, you are able to see New York in a way that, uh, that uh, people are not meant to see New York. Really, really um, 
kind of unusual experience. This is a little bit of its history. That it's curious because there was a railroad. Uh, basically, this this rail yard uh, 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 line was on the city streets, and it was colliding with the citizens, you know, and so causing a lot of deaths. Um, so then it was escorted by a cowboy, basically. That's the way the city dealt with it. Um, and it's not until like 1929 during the you know, Depression that this got that this was um, uh, started to be built. Um, uh, it was finished in 1934 um, at 35 feet up in the air. Um, and then it continued to, um, uh, to function until about 1980. Um, it, uh, turkeys were then the last, frozen turkeys were the last uh, carload. And then um, it just kind of uh, hit the uh, period in, in the development of New York and Chelsea where uh, the arts come in and they gentrify the area. And um, so, so the DR Art Foundation came and then um, uh, the rest is history. Um, so it became uh, a kind of happening place. Um, but it wasn't until um, 1999 that, uh, that the High Line, which was, everyone understood that the High Line would be eventually demolished. Um, and it was, um, but there were a couple of people that actually had a vision about potentially turning it into a park. These were two young guys, um, just citizen activists that decided to quit their day jobs and put their energy into saving the High Line. Um, they commissioned um, uh, photographer uh, 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 Joel Sternfeld to, um, to photograph um, the High Line at different seasons and, and um, in different areas. I and mean, this is really, these, these photographs um, were incredibly important to ultimately saving the High Line because they were published in the New Yorker. And for the first time, the public was able to see um, something that was truly magical that just kind of happened. Um, just out of neglect. And this was airborne seeds, basically, that either just just came in there or were just blown off uh, one of the rail cars. So some were native species and some were not native species. So just kind of Giuliani, um, uh, as his last act of mayor, signed a demolition order, and then Bloomberg came in and reversed the order, and then there was a competition, and we won with field operations, and, um, and then started the project. Um, and one of the things that we discovered, which is really uh, unbelievable, was because this threads through buildings, sometimes it's exposed to sun, sometimes to wind, uh, sometimes it's in cavernous spaces between tall buildings, so there are different shading conditions, lighting, wind, heat, and these various um, uh, uh, species of plants just basically found their microenvironment, their ecosystem. Um, and where, yeah, there were like over a hundred different kinds of weeds and different kinds of, uh, you know, for us it's agriculture and, and landscape, but to suburbanize it's weeds. Uh, but there are these tall grasses and very, very interesting plant life and also um, uh, flora and fauna that, that just kind of congregated there. The, the problem was how do you get the public up there um, without creating a, just a typical path so that nature would have its uh, spot and the public would have its spot. Um, and uh, of course, everything had to be taken out and remediated. There was toxic soil and, and so forth. It was the ballast. Um, we had to redo everything again. Um, but the strategy came out of this. It was the way that culture and nature are constantly kind of taking each other over. And, um, and in this post-industrial site, which was extremely melancholic, we were very, very interested in this taking over of industrial culture. Um, and so we um, invented this, this paving system um, that would interlock, it would comb together with a natural uh, green uh, system and would produce uh, kind of ragged edges and uh, through different types of, of, of these um, um, precast concrete units, um, different kinds of plants could emerge, um, but basically the space between the cracks. And so um, this is, um, uh, and this is a little bit of the way it feels as it's growing in. Um, the entrance, um, uh, Giuliani managed to cut off five blocks of it with this blunt section cut. So we kept it like that and we just brought the soil to the edge um, and then the entrance is just, just beneath. 
Um, and then there are still rail ties in there. Um, the, the benches just come out of the system, um, and it's all, um, it's kind of there, but it's rethought, so the rails are also used. Um, uh, you know, it's a different moment in time, so different kind of industry. And, um, and as it moves in and out of buildings, the buildings, uh, the interior of buildings are lit. And uh, one of the kind of fun things was this spur. So occasionally the High Line kind of takes a deviation. It had to do with loading and unloading. Uh, we just took the actual depth of the steel structure and we just broke the steel apart and made a, uh, a kind of uh, uh, a little uh, place where, the, where, where an audience could gather. Um, and at the very end of that, the stage was this uh, uh, glazed area where we took the steel out, and it was just looking on to 10th Avenue. So from that point of view, um, you could see um, taillights. And a lot of people asked us, you know, from actually people that are from out of town, why do New Yorkers like to stare at traffic? Um, and I think that, you know, maybe it's in keeping with this talk. There's a, there's, there's a lot of things that have to do with nothing, like drilling holes and making fog. And there's a kind of um, love of nothing. This is a kind of Seinfeld, Seinfeld thing, right? That it's, it's a bad, there's something about nothing that's really kind of beautiful. And there's nothing here. It's just a lava lamp of, of taillights. But um, New Yorkers don't know how to do nothing at all. So the fact that they're on the high line doing nothing, like walking, and then they sit and they watch taillights, is the ultimate nothingness. Um, and it seems to, to have caught on a lot. Um, the, the overall um, um, uh, kind of the way, the way we think of um, this thing kind of taking root again, uh, the natural and the man-made, um, is within five years, everything will be grown out. This is only year two. Uh, we're in right now, and um, of, the, of the first section. But as the plants come back and as everything starts to grow in, there's a certain kind of urban growth which is also happening, a kind of urban ecology, and that is unstoppable. And even though you plan to have this kind of, this kind of rethinking of nature, there's the, the culture just kind of wells up and you can control it to a certain point, but um, like we envision lots of activities starting to take place here. Uh, but then others we didn't, like how um, significant this area that was thought of as throwaway real estate, um, in fact, um, devalued, the highlight devalued the real estate right around it. Um, all of a sudden, that real estate started to skyrocket, and before you knew it, there were all these kind of glamorous buildings and glamorous architects all over. This is actually very early, but since then, uh, Gary and Nouvelle and um, you know, just a ton of buildings and, um, and um, as well uh, everyone's branding on the High Line so the High Line Festival for example this David Bowie thing his festival is nowhere near the High Line but it was called the High Line Festival and he capitalized on it and gave the High Line 5% of the proceeds well that's okay uh, <laughs> but it's really kind of interesting there are so many products that are inspired by the High Line, and um, you can see the High Line, so the High Line dress, the High Line um, uh, uh, logo. It's kind of like as ferocious. It's all over the place. Uh, all these, all these um, uh, bits and our, our kind of, um, and then we are not immune to the buzz and the hype. Um, so we entered a contest um, for a gown, to design a gown for Miss Meatpacking District. And so we, we've worked so hard on this. I tell you, there is no job too small for us. And, and we put as much effort into this as we do into a museum project. I mean, so we tried to figure out how to make the bacon hold together without any mechanical fastenings, just how to thread it and the salami and all that. So there's no there's nothing. There's no artifice here except for the, the, the lunch meats themselves, um, and we won. By the way, we, we beat out every like real designers. Um, <laughs> but then, then something else um, started to happen, and I wanted to bring up this this kind of unpredictable other thing that happens in the urban evolution that you cannot control. Um, so at the 20th Street, this is the High Line is just to the right. Those plants that you see are on the High Line. This is a tenement building 
that's just off to the, to the west side. And by um, accident, the, one of the contractor's uh, 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 lights was by chance aimed at this woman's um, uh, fire escape. It, it happened to be that she was a cabaret singer. And so she decided to take advantage of that, and she would come out every night at 7 o'clock and sing. She would bring her mic and her, you know, her speakers and everything, and a whole crowd would gather. Um, and this was, this was called the Renegade Cabaret. And it was uh, it was all over the papers, and it was it was just a kind of you know fantastic thing that just started to happen. Um, the um, the the um, what you call it the uh, what is the name of this hotel? Yeah, the Standard. Thank you. You guys should do the lecture. Uh, anyway, the Standard was built. It was a Polshek building, and it was the one of the only structures that was able to be built over the High Line because of the zoning right there. Um, so this building is all glass, and this phenomenon started to happen, <laughs> where there was this captive audience on the High Line um, in the recreational time, and all of a sudden everyone started to perform, and it was really quite a mossy. <laughs> um, but again, like things you can't make up, and we could have never um, uh, imagined this would happen, and. In fact, we don't really, uh, you know, and it, it, it the, public, <laughs> the public started to come, and uh, all of a sudden, nobody was looking at the High Line, everybody was carrying up. But there was this kind of, um, you know, kind of really great pact um, that the exhibitionists and employers were kind of satisfying one another. Anyway. So, the, so the, the rest of the Highland, it's, uh, so it was built up to like around 20th Street, and and then it's it's continuing up there. So um, as we speak, um, I wanted to show just a couple more things. I know I'm really running late, but just super super quickly, kind of turning um, back around to. Um, to, this is the end of the High Line and to another uh, museum project. And this is one, so what, you know, uh, uh, innovative practice. Um, I mean, I think that probably, you know, not very many people would uh, uh, want to think up a cultural institution. And um, we decided that um, we wanted to, there was a, there was a uh, space, this was uh, going to be a huge development. It's basically like Hong Kong in Manhattan. But there's a, a bit of space, uh, 21,000 square feet, that's designated for cultural use for a, a, a building, some kind of art institution. Uh, and we responded to an RFP, uh, but the question was how to make it sustainable. Uh, because there was, no, there was no museum that wanted to expand, there was no client, uh, there was no money. Um, so how could a museum be self-sustaining? So we came up with this idea of these nesting sheds, telescoping sheds, um, that would increase the, actually I'm just going to go through these slides really quickly. This was the original idea that you could take, um, you could basically start with a building and just by um, having some space, and it has space to the north uh, for this uh, event expansion, you could rent out the space and the, the lower level as a continuous almost 60,000 square feet of space for large events that in, a, in New York can um, can and can bring a lot of money in. So a lot of institutions already rent out their lobbies for thirty thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand a night. So we could do this um, in some way and have a, uh, an art space and kind of pay pay for itself. Um, we're using very conventional um, uh, uh, what's it called sea container gantry system um, uh, to move these sheds. And so this was an early. Uh, depiction and somehow the city really thought that this was great. We actually inverted it. So this project is being developed right now. Um, it's but it's backwards. So there's a base building that's static, and then there are two sheds that uh, that basically um, uh, deploy to increase the footprint of the building. And um, and and when that footprint is is increased, it creates a kind of like a Crystal Palace effect, uh, uh, or a, um, uh, just a very, very large, airy, open space that could be closed off. Um, and so you can have events over 60,000 square feet, like Fashion Week or something like that. Um, and then you can, and this only happens a couple of times a year. Um, and sometimes you can just take one or two sheds out and just have a gala event. Meanwhile, 
the building itself, the cultural institution, has its autonomy. It has three stack galleries and interstitial space. Um, and um, so this is the current state of the project. And it is um, very much in development. Um, but this is one of the kind of crazy things that, that we're doing. Um, there's no money to really sustain it. But we're getting a following from the city and, uh, and from the developer. And right now, they're bringing in, they're designing uh, in the platform that will be built over Hudson Yards, the infrastructure that will support um, this track system. And so this is really washed out. Sorry about that. OK, the very last thing I'm going to show um, has to do with digits. And uh, you know, it's my firm belief that, that um, architecture is made of bits and, and, and pixels and, and bricks and mortar as well. So, um, this uh, project that was very, very important to us um, was created for the, uh, the Cartier Foundation. It's a um, uh, project that was done with Laura Corrigan and, and, uh, and uh, Mark Hansen. Um, and the, um, it's, a, it's basically an immersive 35-foot um, uh, di diameter space. Um, it's a video projection of six projectors. Um, it's based on a kind of uh, uh, early conversations with Paul Virilio, who is, uh, was the curator of the, the bigger show at the Cartier, and was all about human migration. This particular piece was about migration, human migration for political, economic, and environmental reasons. And um, the basic um, uh, notion is that uh, there is, a, there is a, uh, uh, a large globe that orbits around the space. And it takes 45 seconds for it to do a complete orbit. And when it orbits, it deposits information on the walls. Um, and it also erases information. And um, all of the information that's created, so here it is, it looks very, very three-dimensional. So um, it looks like a physical thing. It actually looks like that in the space. Right now, it's at the very beginning. It's it's basically printing pixels, and those pixels are now just migrating to uh, the cities of the world. This is all data, data based, so um, there's a kind of graphic treatment and an action in the programming, and it's the land masses that you're going to see are totally created um, out of data, so there's no design really. Um, so this is, um, uh, we're looking at um, uh, basically just a couple of years into the future about the uh, uh, migration, 50% of the world's population um, um, will be in cities, or it is actually, as of this decade. And so this is all pixels. There's no landmass drawn there. It's just the migration of all those pixels that were on the wall. This entire uh, project, and these are just little snippets, it's, it's uh, 45 minutes long and it's conti continuous. It's one long graphic story uh, that's told. And, and now the uh, sphere is laying out um, these lines, and uh, these are uh, decreases of population in cities, and also we're going to show uh, cities with, um, or areas, um, with increased population, you could see the land masses again. This is all, again, done just with data. Uh, there's no design here. And, um, but we felt an obligation to also kind of identify uh, where we are. What was really interesting about this, that there was this segment about population. There was um, um, this segment that was about remittances. This was about movement of populations for economic reasons. People move. Um, to get jobs, and they sent their wages home, and, and these are called remittances. Um, and the way that this behaved is actually the populations, proportional populations, uh, relative to these flags, are brought into the U.S. flag. So there's the remitting nation and the the, the, the others, the biggest um, uh, remitters. And you could see the relationship between Mexico, India, the Philippines, and the United States. And we did this for the top uh, five remitting uh, major nations that, that, uh, that have these uh, uh, populations that come there for labor, cheap labor. Um, this continued, this was all contiguous flow, and this was now filling up um, 
a kind of relative uh, uh, monetary unit, and just to see, um, again, from Canada, from Great Britain, Japan, and so forth, to see how much the, the various nations, 100 nations around, are, are actually acquiring, uh, or, or how much remittance is going into those nations from the emitters. And um, moving along, and this, this continues to go into various stories. This is a political one. This is showing um, the movement of populations uh, for political reasons. And um, so here we have um, refugees, and, and we have also internally displaced people. So people that are uh, basically had to leave their homes, but they're stuck in their own country. Um, in camps and so forth, and this is all over the world, and we look at this by year, um, and we go to from where the data is available, and then we build it up as the years progress. So you can really start to see a lot of int uh, interesting coincidences. Now, people, um, we showed um, this at um, in a lecture at the World Economic Forum, and policymakers were very, very interested in this, because they never seen information quite presented this way. And um, actually, when it was at the, uh, at the Cartier, um, the intersection between environmental, uh, political, and, uh, and economic reasons for, for movement of the population was, was never really configured together in uh, a visualizing system. And we didn't. We had no um, real intention. We just found the information just by graphically depicting it. This is the new global um, uh, division between North and South, so it's no longer just the equator. It's, it's this um, new division, which is really uh, about first world, third world conditions. And um, we started to map uh, the floods of the same um, magnitude. And, uh, and we looked at them from the global South and global North in terms of its physical impact and how many lives any of these storms impacted. So something, an equal-sized storm here um, in, um, in the global South would displace many, many you know, people. I mean, this basically is a story of infrastructure and, uh, and poverty. And then we went into sinking cities and um, all of that. And then here we're laying out basically the carbon foot footprint. Um, of, again, no, there's no drawing here. There's no landmass. It's exactly taken from emissions um, uh, data. And so it prints uh, a map of the world. And then um, we burn it off. And then this is then. Um, another rotation, this is, uh, information is picked up again on another cycle. And then we begin to see, um, I'm not really sure what's on this image, but I, I think we begin to see um, over 50 years, uh, yeah, here. So that, that globe uh, also left behind the trace of the uh, kind of a thermal map, and um, here it is. And this is just a two degree difference over 50 years, and it shows um, climate warming, um, climate change throughout the world, just based on those emissions. So um, this, this is just a little snippet of the project, but, um, um, and here I'm going to end, um, this is now depicting the cities that are, that are at stake, which are mostly coastline cities that will ultimately uh, be flooded if in poor countries and not if in wealthy countries. Um, so um, I know I took a lot of time and uh, I just um, you know, wanted to just show you a smattering of different kinds of projects, maybe slightly illogical, but thank you.
Carl Brent Brothers. <laughs> and the next thing we know, he's the third name on your marquee. That's right. So could you tell us, for the sake of all of these young students who are here now, how, from your point of view, how he got there from here? Okay, that's a, that's, thank you for asking that question. I wasn't even thinking about making that association. So, so we are three partners. Um, Rick and I started our studio, um, and we were uh, doing independent work uh, for a while. And we started to do slowly. We started to do more and more architectural work. Charles came into our studio um, as an employee, um, and I was telling some people that I, I ran into today that that um, Charles showed us some really crazy bicycle track thing. I don't know what it was. It was not, not a track, but it was like a bicycle chain. And he had made this kind of model out of a bicycle. Anyway, I don't know really what it was. I can't quite remember, but I, this is a special guy. Um, and we hired him, um, and he had already, he had just done a master's degree at Columbia after he had done some work outside. And Charles um, uh, was working with us on a number of different projects. He was working on Blur, he was working on Brasserie, and a bunch of different projects, the ICA. And then we, he became more and more significant in the studio. Um, and at a certain point, we realized that, boy, Charles is a really a, an equal collaborator here, you know, and the work that's coming out of the studio. Um, our studio is very bottom up, but um, some people kind of just rise just naturally and, uh, and uh, are just uh, natural uh, uh, creators. And, and Charles, you know, I mean, who would have known it? And who would have known that we would have even share the marquee? I mean, I was, it was impossible for me to even share a bed with Rick or a bank account to share authorship and then to share it with a third person. It was unbelievable. Um, now our, our studio is, uh, and, and Charles and Rick and I, um, do all the work. All of the projects are done by all of us, and we don't, this is the one thing, it's kind of Ma and Pa and the other guy. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we, we, we actually, we don't uh, sever the work, we don't kind of um, have each partner do indi individual things. We all struggle with all of it. And then we, um, we have kids in the studio that are um, adding ideas into the projects, and uh, no matter where it comes from, we're uh, not concerned about the hierarchy. So um, I think I think that the, the question um, is really about how you go from from nowhere to somewhere. I mean, it's also us. Uh, we never intended to. Um, uh, we could have only um, you know uh, dreamed about MacArthur and. Um, um, Sarah said that we were the first, um, well, we were the first architects to get it. Um, we never in a million years would think that our work, our independent work, would be recognized um, and be recognized as architecture. So we were kind of in between disciplines and everyone thought we were the other. So the artists thought we were architects, the architects thought we were artists. We didn't belong to anything. When the MacArthur acknowledged us, it was like, um, and uh, all of a sudden, this kind of dissident practice that didn't actually physically make buildings was recognized um, um, at, by, at, as part of the architectural discipline. And, and, uh, and then as we started to, to have a little bit of financial freedom that, that that gave us, it allowed us to kind of back up and think harder and also take in uh, projects every once in a while. When Charles came into the studio, he was, um, he fired up our juices to actually want to grow up faster. Um, and so it's been a really great process with, um, with um, great partners. And he's one of you. He's here tonight. He was here today. He was an undergraduate here. Amazing. But I heard that he did exceptional work then. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any, any other questions? Sure. At the beginning of your lecture, you said that you were looking forward to compiling your work to see what common threads you saw in your work. And uh, I don't know, to me, seeing from the beginning to the end, especially at the end, it seemed like voyeurism was a big part of sort of the design driver, <clears throat> sort of culminating with those shots of the, the naked folk in the hotel. But I was just wondering, like, it's so apparent, I was just wondering where that comes into your design process and if that's sort of the, like with the cloud, it's about the opposite and with the highlights, you know, they're opposed, but it's still always about lawyers, and I'm just wondering where that... 
Well, it's, it's, um, we're interested in visuality, which is kind of more broadly thought of as the culture of vision. So it's not so much voyeurism only, but it's also uh, vision as power, so surveillance. Um, it's um, it's uh, uh, yeah the pleasure that we take uh, by watching each other. It's kind of give and take, so reciprocity uh, between exhibitionism and voyeurism. Um, it's it's just about the you know sometimes just um, uh, you know I think that we're at a certain point in our culture where there are so many cameras that, that there are so few black uh, blackout areas that we we actually welcome being observed and we often perform for cameras um, and it's the same thing that happened with um, large span glass you know there was a point where it was. Uh, just this very optimistic utopian material, and then by the middle of the century, of the 20th century, it got to be a little bit um, uh, paranoid, you know, uh, and then it became bronze, and then, and then it started now. We're going for low iron glass everywhere, and everybody wants to have the most transparent, most crystalline glass. Um, it's, there is this, um, this, this culture that's very um, uh, optically centric, and the, the blur building was really about that. It was a ocular, it was, it was a kind of, um, it, that, that was an exhibition, exposition pavilion where there was nothing to see and nothing to do except think about our dependence on vision. So a, a lot of the projects, yes, come around to various states of, of, uh, of vision and, uh, um, and even that framed view um, on the high line looking down. Um, onto the traffic, um, I think back on, on Slow House and, um, and, and the ICA where we're framing bits of context. I think that you naturally, in your career, you, you, um, there, are, there are things that are never quite complete. They're not finished research projects, they're just ongoing interests. And culture changes, things change around you, and even your own opinion changes. We were, um, you know, we, we felt that, you know, like anti-surveillance, and then we realized, well, you know, surveillance is, uh, it's not so much surveillance, it's performing now. And, and so culture kind of twisted around us, and we're now looking at, 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 at display in a different way. Um, we're also very interested in the, the display in museums um, and uh, how things are shown and how, to, how a museum makes its first frame and then how uh, a gallery is made and so forth. Um, it's, it's, there's just a lot of work that continues to be about that. Maybe one of the real the moments where we veered in another direction is at uh, Lincoln Center on the Tully Hall, a project I didn't show. But it, that project was about airborne sound, it was about acoustics. And vision was just supplemental to uh, another sense. So it was really an interesting uh, moment of departure where we're very, very conscious of actually doing something in relationship to another, to another sense. Sorry. I, I had a question actually about your insistence at the end when talking about the Cartier um, installation. You're insisted several times that it wasn't designed. You know, that, and, and, and I sort of find that, I have to say, a little bit shocking because it seems like that's exactly your, your, and I think why the MacArthur chose you all is precisely that you found a spot in between two disciplines and instead of uh, sort of hiding between the two disciplines, you sort of pushed them both aside and created this new practice. And it seems that part of that is precisely um, acknowledging that design or practice is, is that whole realm. And so why the insistence on this is not design. Well, okay. Um, I, I think that. The objective. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a complicated thing. I, you know, for for the High Line, for example, we wanted to defend the High Line from architecture. I mean, it was basically strategic, and it was it wasn't anti-design. Obviously, everything is very very designed, but there's a kind of anti-architecture <laughs> spirit there. Um, um, it doesn't it doesn't want a lot of stuff. It wants just the minimum of of a touch to let something happen. And in, in the case of, um, and, and this is just uh, addressing specifically the, the Cartier project, uh, Terra um, it, um, I, I emphasize the no design. Um, I, I obviously, it's, I mean, everything we do is highly, highly designed. And we're not, uh, not embarrassed about it. We're very proud of it. But um, we're not concocting information. It's the thing that's unique about that project 
is we uh, kind of designed a performance, or a look and style. Um, we took the data and we gave it its performance characteristics and then it just did its thing. And part of the strength of that project is that we didn't, um, there was no polemic to it. You know, like where um, uh, Virilio started um, when he introduced us to the project, the overall project, he actually had an agenda and the agenda was that the world is bad and you know we do we we make people move where we're you know bad politics is bad economics is bad everything should all move to the moon I mean basically you know it's an anti-technology anti-contemporary um, to kind of argument um, for for us we we actually wanted to resist making any kind of value judgments we just wanted to see the evidence just the facts but when you see those facts um, just the statistics. Your eyes glaze over, you don't get it. Um, that's why some of the, you know, when we see sort of some of the cartograms in the New York Times, you know, uh, often, and you see the red states and blue states or things like that, you start to see a mapping in a different way, in a way that is um, delivering information, um, you know, in a way that's very surprising and um, has a certain effect. Uh, the effect that we wanted to create in this 45 minute story was an emotional one. We actually, it's telling a story, um, and it has chapters, um, um, and it, it has emotive effects without uh, resorting to pictorial, you know, or, or anything that's kind of designed to make you feel something specific. It's just kind of does it just by the, the information. I, Sarah's is, is shaking her head. I mean, there is, we're, we're, we're editing which kind of information we want to show, but we're not editing, um, you know, within a certain territory of political refugees and recorded movements. We're recording all of them, as, as many of them as data sites that we could find. And of course, all data isn't collected. That's already politicized, and that's an important factor. Uh, the last description sounds a lot like the Eames, for example. I'm wondering how you would position your work relative to the Eames, who are sort of paradigmatic designers. Oh, I never really think of it. That's a no, nice. I, that, I, thank I, you. I, That's I, a nice association. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we have. There's one more person in the mix. I, you know, um, but I guess I, I guess that you know that, uh, that it's it's an interesting parallel because we um, for us we don't see any kind of borders between architecture, um, information, design, um, uh, landscape, uh, video, you know, and. and uh, performance, we do a lot of performance and even product design, stuff like that. We don't, um, we don't really, um, each, each project, potential project in front of us is kind of, uh, it produces some challenges and if, um, you know, and, and, and so in a sense we, I'm not sure, did, did, the, did, did the Eameses actually have a trajectory that they followed? Or was it more I think specifically of the design of information, or let's say mm -hmm. you don't want to use the word design, the, the constitution of information, which they obviously yeah. were very wrapped up in. Yeah. And it, it's really the last project and maybe a couple yeah. of other things along the way that, for example, the ice, the ice water uh, would, would fall into that category as well. And I don't, I don't, you know, it actually only arose in this exchange and a little bit looking at the work. Um, and I hadn't thought of your work that way before myself, so I don't know. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a kind of wonderful um, parallel, um, and I it, it's you know maybe there's something there because we are interested in a lot of overlapping things. I think if the Eames had the technology that we have, uh, the programming capabilities and all of that, we we probably would have seen more strange things evolve. I mean, they had to do things a long way very often. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's really um, you know and and. And the one thing I, I should say is that, that it, because we, the, the work is very complex, it's based on a lot of technology, some of the stuff I show involves weather engineers and robotics engineers and programmers and, data and, and statisticians and we, our world um, has many, many uh, layers of people involved and, uh, and that's one of the things that, um, that I think in a, in a kind of specialized society, you know, professionalized society, we're able to actually exploit that by just collaborating further and deeper. So uh, we don't try to do everything ourselves. We bring in a lot of, a lot of help. Well, Houston, the powers of 10 includes dinner. So we have to actually conclude. Okay, so just have one more. There's just one fellow. Another association uh, that I started to think about with the Broad Museum 
then you have uh, the veil and the bolt, and the bolt is uh, Mises, and that's where in a Mises building right now, the plinth and the umbrella diagram. And then with the Hudson uh, project and its expansion, another Mises universal space, mm -hmm. an, an exploration of that. Yeah. And I was just curious about that. Um, I, not a direct reference, but certainly a part of the um, the, the mental makeup. Uh, and uh, we we really truly believe that that we don't we don't uh, start from nowhere. We uh, we don't believe in a tabula rasa. We start at a certain point in a problem, and the problem has preexisted us. Um, and uh, the techniques and techniques have preexisted us, and some were inventing. And so uh, the association um, with uh, these spaces is really interesting. I mean, we, you know, I think some of it is unconscious, you know, perhaps. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that the mobility of that project probably is probably its invention, its ability to like a toy to transform. It's a transformer building, um, but the ability to kind of make a st space that's ex ex extensible uh, that extends out in different ways, not only optically, but physically, is uh, something that we're adding to the mix. Okay, lots of stomachs grumbling. Thank you very much. Thank you.